So today, um, we're actually marking two yard sites. And each one tells a story of resilience. And it feels um, not only uh, important, but also affirming to call attention to these two yard sites. One you probably know about, that on the secular calendar, not the Jewish calendar, but on the secular calendar, um, this Sunday will mark the first year anniversary since the shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. And so we are remembering the 11 who were slain that day, including Joyce Feinberg, who was born and raised here at Holy Blossom, educated here, married here, and then went to become, she and her husband both, to be active members of the Tree of Life Synagogue. We've planted a tree in her memory. Some of you were there. The plaque is now installed, and so her name, her Shem Tov, will always be a part of this congregation. The second yard site that I want to call attention to today, and I'm going to speak about both independently, is for someone named Regina Jonas. Does anyone recognize that name? Oh, good. I see a few, a few hands. Regina Jonas was the first woman, as far as we know, to be ordained as a rabbi. We actually knew about her, and then we didn't know about her, and now we know about her, and forevermore we will know about her. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. But this Shabbat of Bereshit, we have every reason to believe, is the yard site date, 75 years since she was murdered at Auschwitz. And so I'd like to speak about her and her commitments and her resilience as well. But let's go back to Pittsburgh. And I wonder if you want to turn to your neighbor, take a moment, and just share with one another a memory of where you were when you heard the news. Can you remember? It was a Shabbat. For some, it will be very clear. Some, you might have to um, look back at the calendar. But share with one another where you were and how you felt when the news first reached you. So I imagine for many the memory is quite clear, as it is for me. I was here, we were on the bima, and Cantor Meisner was singing the closing song, and a guest of the Bar Mitzvah family approached the bima, and she whispered in my ear, Rabbi, there's been a terrible shooting in Pittsburgh at a synagogue. You must not have heard, because she was expecting me to announce it, but of course I had not heard. So we concluded the service, and then everyone started to congregate informally, and very swiftly the news made its way through the synagogue. And our president, Temple President Judy Winberg, came up to me right away, and she said, I have a cousin in Pittsburgh. And lo and behold, the unthinkable was confirmed the next morning that her cousin, Joyce Feinberg, was among those who had been murdered that day. So it's still is strange. I mean, I say the words, we read the news, we, we know it's true, and yet it still seems somehow unbelievable that in our time and in this amazing North America where there is freedom and respect for humanity that uh, such a thing would come to be. A poem came out this week written by a, a teenager named Hannah Daniel. And it's called, They Sat in the Back. She imagines that at the back of the sanctuary that day must have been the young ones and the elders together. 
They sat at the back. We sat in the back. We were 13 years old, itchy, tired, and we didn't want to be there. We were anxious to leave our seats. We sat in the back to sulk, to count on our fingers how many more Saturday morning services we would have to endure before we could check the box for our B'nai Mitzvah. We picked at our nails, but we sang the blessings because we loved them even still. The minutes limped along. We shifted in our dresses and our ballet flats that were getting a little too small. Our stomachs rumbled as we waited for a kiddush, and we sat in the back of the room. They also sat in the back. Our matriarchs, our door holders, the ones who had prepared our kiddush that morning, the ones who knew the code to the building was the same year it was built, the ones who drove us to this service. They were the ones who sang in the choir, the ones who taught your children their Aleph Bet. They sat nearest to the entrance, the ones who walked with walkers, the ones who parked right outside the temple doors to rest their stiff backs on stiffer benches each Shabbat morning, the ones who have seen their children and their children's children through the sanctuary's doors. They built this place up from the ground and they sat in the back. We did not want to sit in the front where we might catch the eye of the rabbi, where God might see our lips stumble on our prayers. So we sat in the back so we might easily slip out to use the washroom, to get a drink of water, to check the broken clock in the hall. We sat in the back so that we could be the first to leave. They sat in the back because they arrived early. They were our living ancestors, our minion makers. They sat in the back and they knew your name because they had been the first ones to welcome your family into the synagogue with a warm hug and a boker tov. We sat in the back. We wanted to leave. They sat in the back. They didn't have time. Tomorrow at 5 o'clock, there will be a virtual memorial vigil to remember the 11 lost. And I urge you um, to pause. It's called uh, Pause with Pittsburgh at 5 o'clock tomorrow. Jews around the globe will just pause wherever they are for just a moment to remember. And not just Jews, I should say. Uh, good people of all, of all kinds. So an article came out this week written by Rabbi Amy Bardak, who is, um, I think her title is something like Dean of Jewish Life for Pittsburgh through the UJA. And she's the one who is responsible for organizing tomorrow's vigil in Pittsburgh. And she's also been responsible for a lot of um, pastoral counseling throughout the year, helping people uh, with their sorrow, with their trauma. And she writes this article about resilience, saying that she's learned a lot about resilience this year, and that it seems there is no blueprint. There is no... Uh, one way to resilience. She talks about how some people can't sleep, can't eat, and other people can only sleep and only eat. And she talks about how people, some people can't cry and other people can't stop crying. And she talks about how some people turn towards Judaism, they study Torah, they're praying more than they ever were before. They've taken up Jewish traditions with a new rigor. And that others instead turn to outreach and building bridges with, between Jews and other peoples of other religions and other ethnic backgrounds. And that that's how they find their way to resilience, a way forward. And she says that for her, it's really through joy. She tells the story of when she hosted a lachayim, a sheva brachot, for a couple that was married the day after the shooting. 
And everyone at the L'chaim was somehow touched, either directly or indirectly. And yet they raised their glasses and they toasted the bride and groom and their future. And she said then it was her daughter's 15th birthday party that had been planned long ago and they went ahead with it. And everyone there held hands and they quietly shared their stories. But they were able to find their way to a joyful rendition of happy birthday to you. And she says that's how it will be for the Tree of Life congregation as well. That on November 16th, which will be the actual yard site date on the Hebrew calendar, they've already planned not only a memorial service, but also the celebration of one congregant's 100th birthday. So they are deliberately intermingling the sadness with the joy, because that is the Jewish way. So now let me tell you a little bit about Regina Jonas and how she also was tremendously resilient and did find many kinds of joy even in the midst of fear and horror. An article from Rabbi Laura Geller, who is the third woman to be ordained as a rabbi. Um, for many years now, she's been the senior rabbi of Temple Emmanuel of Beverly Hills. And she was part of a delegation that went to Berlin to um, embrace the archives that were newly discovered in East Berlin, uh, all about Rabbi Jonas. So she was deported um, from Theresien on October 12, 1944, and arrived at Auschwitz two days later, October 14th, which was Shabbat Bereshit. And according to the records, it seems that she was killed that very day upon her arrival. And so it is on Shabbat Bereshit every year that we can remember her good name for Kaddish. Born in Berlin, 1902, into a poor Orthodox Jewish family, Jonas was influenced by her Orthodox rabbi, Dr. Max Weil, who allowed girls to become bat mitzvah in a public way, recognized not to read from Torah, but to be publicly recognized as Benot Mitzvah. And at his urging, Jonas continued her studies at the liberal Hochschuler, um, the, higher, the place for higher Jewish learning in Berlin. She was there from 1924 to 1930. And there were many other women in her class, um, but they were going on learning to become teachers of Judaism. Where Jonas, like the men in the class, wanted to become a rabbi. And she said so at an early age. Her primary supporter was Rabbi Banneth, who was determined to ordain her, but he died just before she finished her coursework. Her thesis was entitled, Can a Woman Be a Rabbi According to Halakha, According to Jewish Legal Sources? And the, th the thesis received praise from her teachers, although none of them agreed to ordain her, including Rabbi Leo Beck, who is one of our heroes of the reform movement. In fact, um, let's see, on the window I can't see, the middle one over there at the very top has um, a picture of Rabbi Leo Beck there. He's one of the greats of the 20th century, and yet he was not prepared then to ordain a woman. Why is noteworthy? He was afraid that it would fracture the Jewish people and that at such a delicate and worrisome time, no rabbi should do anything to build cracks or fissures among the Jewish people, that what we needed most then was Jewish unity. And so even though it seems he, he certainly supported her, he may have even wanted to ordain her, but he would not then because of uh, the worries of the day and his commitment to achdut, to Jewish unity. She was uh, ultimately ordained privately in a private ceremony by Rabbi Max Dynaman, the president of the General Association of Rabbis in Germany, on December 27, 1935. And from that day forward, she did struggle to be accepted. 
She, um, there was an article written in the Jewish press in 1936 saying that her ordination was a form of treason and a caricature of Judaism. And so she, at first, did not work in synagogues, but rather in the hospital settings and in homes for the aged and in schools for the children. But as more and more rabbis either emigrated out of Germany or uh, just became too old for service, her prominence grew because she was a great rabbi and people wanted to learn from her. And so, slowly but surely, she was giving sermons in great synagogues and invited to teach Torah uh, in many Jewish circles. In November 1942, she, together with her mother, were deported to Theresienstadt, uh, and there she worked side by side with the famous psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl. And he admired her very much, and the two of them worked uh, also with Rabbi Leo Beck to support uh, the Jews in Theresienstadt. So, I mentioned she was taken to Auschwitz and there she perished on Shabbat Bereshit. But the mystery continues. In 1991, when Katharina von Kellenbach, a professor of religious studies at St. Mary College of Maryland, went to do research in the archives in Berlin, she accidentally stumbled upon a small box filled with Jonas's works, with Rabbi Jonas's papers. Among them is a note dated November 6, 1942, written by an acquaintance of Jonas, explaining that these documents were given to him on the day that Jonas and her mother were deported. Her papers include a photograph of her, now a famous photograph of her dressed in rabbinic robes, wearing a rabbinic um, headdress, holding a copy of her thesis, and her ordination certificate, which also, uh, the thesis and the ordination certificate are also in this box of archives. She kept some newspaper clippings that referred to how people spoke against her and how people spoke in her favor, about how she struggled for acceptance. Also in this little box are some letters written by Jewish refugees who had fled out of Germany and were writing to Rabbi Jonas to say, thank you for looking after my aging parents. I wish I could be the one to do it, but thank you for being my agent and looking after them. We all know from the contents of this little box that she also fell in love and that she and, um, looking for his name, from Berlin, forgive me, um, that they had exchanged some love letters and he said, um, I hope while we need to say goodbye now, I hope that we will see one another soon. But that never came to be. So she was the definition of resilience, and we should know her. She should be among the rabbis and the, the Jewish leaders that we, that we speak of by name, that we talk about. Uh, their stories are part of the lexicon of Jewish history. So let me conclude with her words then. Because they do relate to this parashat bereshit, this Torah portion, all about creation. She writes in, on June 23rd, 1938, if I, conf if I confess what motivated me, a woman, to become a rabbi, two things come to mind. My belief in God's calling and my love of human beings. God planted in our hearts skills and a vocation without asking about gender. Therefore, it is the duty of men and women alike to work and to create according to the skills given by God. It is our religious duty to work and to create according to our God-given skills. 
In this week's parasha, God says, Na'ase, let us create, let us make. To whom is God speaking? God was the only creator at the beginning. Human beings had not yet walked the earth. Perhaps God was speaking to us, Na'ase, to each and every one of us. Let us make, let us create, let us innovate, let us drive forward, come what may. Let us be resilient and have a sense of imagination about the future. Even in dark times, even when it seems the world has stopped, the world keeps spinning. And we can continue walking forward through it. Amen.